Um, I'm, uh, I'm probably going to speak both on a sort of conceptual level for a little while and then also try to come down to some actual projects, uh, the instantiation of those ideas in some way or another. Let me just see if this will work as well. So, th I mean, th uh, this makes people dizzy, this presentation software, so if you need to leave the room, it's okay. Um, my, my name is Jamie Allen. Hello. Uh, Hello. Thank you. <laughs> it's hard to see you. Um, and uh, this, my website is heavyside.net if you want. I won't take you through my entire uh, life story, but I think it's probably relevant to talk a little bit about my present context. Um, so right now I work at a place called the Culture Lab, which is a university's center for art and technology and art and science. Um, and the reason I bring this up is because largely my interest in context these days has to do with creating contexts for other people to work within. So I'm assistant director at this place, as well as, of course, the influence that I might have on my own practice as an artist. And, um, and my work work is generally concerned with with probably less music but more sound art and new media um, and, and kind of the positioning of art and technology uh, in a very general sense. Um, what we do at Culture Lab is kind of a, you know, a many splendid thing. Um, a lot of public events. We have uh, a lot of shows and exhibitions of student work and researchers that do things like music and psychology and art and technology and perception and, um, and, and visual art. Um, we have a lot of uh, artist residencies and, uh, and kind of visiting, visiting musicians and artists, and we work with a lot of local and, um, and international groups. Um, and, and, and again, I just say that because uh, at the moment that is where I'm working and it, and it, and it becomes a kind of, uh, I mean, it's, it's as broad as what you were describing, Taco, in the sense that uh, there's a lot of different kinds of artwork happening, but we're also interfacing to all these other different sort of societal mechanisms, institutions, universities, uh, and, and other groups. Um, so what I wanted to talk about today is uh, ostensibly titled On the Collaboration of People, Media, and Technologies. Um, and I think I'll start the whole thing with a story about soup. Um, so there's a group of travelers on their way from one village to another. They, um, they come into town, they set up a fire, they put a, a, a sort of vat of water on top of the fire and plop a stone into the, into the soup. And they just sort of sit there, watch it boil, watch it boil, watch it boil. And then, of course, somebody from the village comes along and says, what are you doing? What, are, what, are you, what is this? And they're like, well, we're making soup. It's called stone soup, and this stone is magical. And if you boil it long enough, it becomes this amazing soup. And so the villager sits down and sort of waits and starts thinking, well, it gets a little bored. He's like, well, what? I have some potatoes at home. Do, do, do potatoes go good with stone soup? And he goes and gets them, and they put them in the soup. And then another villager comes in and says, well, you know, I have peas. And then another villager, garlic. And they build this great soup up, right? Um, and then at the end of it all, they eat it, and, and all the villagers are like, how did you make this amazing soup? And they all look at each other, and there's, you know, there's variations on the end of that story, actually. Um, and it can either be read as a kind of... Uh, uh, I don't know, like a con, right? That the, that the travelers were coming through town trying to trick everyone into making this soup for them. I prefer to read it as a way of, uh, of looking at collaboration uh, between people and with objects. You know, there's a certain power that that stone has as a technology to uh, elicit and bring about sort of uh, both social and, and, and sort of um, material changes in that situation. That's a Portuguese uh, folktale, by the way, and I have a friend who's from Portugal, and she said when she was a little girl, she used to boil stones all the time, trying to make great soup. Um, so this has a lot of uh, background in media studies, I think, uh, for me, meaning um, you know people like McLuhan, who talked about this respect for tools and objects, the difference between a vinyl record and a file uh, is not uh, only a sort of medial and distribution difference, it's a difference in how we think about the ontology of a piece of artwork, right? So you were addressing this a little bit. It, it opens up the ways in which we can even think about what a piece is, and so for musicians this becomes problematic, for record companies it becomes even more problematic. Um, and then we can also think about this idea of an extension, uh, the idea that you know all of these new medias basically are derived from a desire that we might have. So um, a, a record ostensibly is about mortality, right, or about the way that we want to inscribe our voice into something. And an MP3 might be about this kind of promise that we've always had for a, a weightless discourse, right? We can kind of ESP to each other. Um, 
And those are conjectures, by the way. Uh, but that idea that, that, that there's something about extension leads into kind of more recent media studies and people like Bernhard Stiegler, who um, his link to music is probably most salient with, uh, he was director of ERCOM in Paris for quite a while in the early 2000s, I think. Um, anyway, he talks about this idea of technogenesis, which is not only that we are extended by our technologies, but that we're fundamentally situated by them. Uh, the classic example that I used to explain this, um, I don't think it's his example, is that um, everything that is around us is in a sense genetic because it's what we use to implant culture into our own world. So it's an extension of um, of, our, of our mental capacities. A table is about the different social relationships that a table enables. Uh, so an ant, this is the, the example, pardon me. The, the, the ant is born basically with all the genetic information that it needs, right? It, it, I don't know how an ant is born, but it comes out of some queen or something, an egg. Sorry. Um, anyway, and in that moment, it knows everything it needs to know. It, needs to, it, knows, it knows that it needs to go and get a leaf and bring it back to the queen. It knows that, you know, how to feed itself. It knows how to potentially have an, an ant baby. I, uh, again, I don't know much about ants. Um, but then babies, if you put a baby in a forest, it would die. Right? It's a very harsh thing to say. But if you put a baby in a forest, it wouldn't survive because it doesn't have the cultural information embedded in its genetics. It has it in the world. It has it inside things like cribs and air conditioning and fire and, you know. Um, and so in this sense, everything that it is to be human is to be technological. When you pick up a stick that's been sharpened because one of your ancestors sharpened it, it means that you are automatically have this link to your own history and to, to a genetic code that's embedded in, in the tools that we use. Um, so again, that, that's just sort of, in my sense, in, in my way of thinking about it, that's sort of an upgrade to McLuhan's idea that there's a subject that's being extended. We're actually not really that subjectivized. We're actually just sort of situated within all this, and this is how we create ourselves intersubjectively, as the phrase goes. Um, this next idea is that you know uh, people like Bruno Latour and Graham Harman and this really kind of uh, hip philosophy movement now uh, that everybody's into called um, uh, speculative realism, uh, which is to give back some of the agency to objects, right? To try to figure out ways of talking about um, things like you know uh, rocks and hammers and and ants, I guess, um, in ways that give them back some of the agency that we may have robbed of them in sort of romantic discourses that situate everything in the human being. So object entity and beings have their own creativity that can never be caught inside a larger, more complete one. So I'm introducing these ideas by way of sort of criticizing what I think is kind of a tendency within art and technology to put the human in the center, put the human at the top, put the human throughout this entire sort of uh, production um, chain, uh, you know, at the, at the position of control. And so uh, this has got a long history, um, which of course leads all the way up to the kind of tools that we now use for things like manipulating music. And, and the word controller, of course, is not... Uh, belays this whole idea. Um, and you also wonder, you know, when we use metaphors like this to talk about new interfaces for musical expression or, uh, you know, the other ways of uh, manipulating media for artistic purposes, why there's, you know, a kind of sexual politic that seems unbalanced in art and technology. Um, and this is a very acknowledged thing. You know, this is a diagram that I used to use when I was teaching new interfaces for musical expression at ITP at NYU. Um, Bill, Bill Verplank, you know, he talks about the history of interaction design from a militaristic perspective. It really comes out of that. Um, we, originally, we tried to build safe things, then we tried to build them effectively, then we tried to build them more efficiently, then we tried to build them so that people could understand how they worked or a mental model of how they worked. Um, and then, you know, the idea of them being engaging and then somewhat expressive is the next layer of that. Um, and, and I'm just, I guess I'm just bringing this up because sometimes when you look at the way that interactive art actually functions or interactive music systems, you start to get this sense that it might be the wrong model to begin with. Not to say that it doesn't help you understand certain things. Um, so how do we use those sort of models to explain something like this, right? Is it the right kind of model? Um, and I guess I, was, I would just suggest that no, it is not. Uh, the individual is only an aspect or phase of a process, but the process is what is important. That's, again, a Stiegler quote. So somebody like John Coltrane, you can't analyze that person as a person without analyzing them in terms of the great state of North Carolina where he grew up, the saxophone and how it was designed, the idea that he kind of came up in an era that started to have sort of recorded music and, and the popularity of that, heroin, ethanol, you know, his interest in, in, in um, Kabbalah and how that might have led to some of the chromatic third variations that he was interested in. All these, I mean, I can go on and on and on. The train, right? His nickname was The Train. That puts a certain sort of men mental picture in your own head when you some people, someone, you come into a 
gig and someone says, hey, train, you know, it's going to give you a certain style. Um, so that idea, just that there's something uh, that's missing from our common discourses about art and technology. And I think there's another history, and we touched on some of the conceptual art basis of this stuff, um, which I think is important. Um, you know, that, that realizes, I guess, uh, in, 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 a, in a genealogical sense, in, in terms of art and technology, something that I think might have been a lost opportunity in the mid-20th century, um, where art and technology really was at this burgeoning moment where it could have sort of blossomed in a different way. Um, but unfortunately, certain sort of efforts and, and conceptualizations didn't allow it. So uh, people like Namjoon Paik, who I spent the summer studying at the Namjoon Paik Center in uh, Gyeonggi, in, uh, in Korea, you know, you come across images like this, and this is just something to stare at for a little while and think about what's happening there, right? You know, in terms of medial relationships and relationships between people and technology. Um, and I think he's one of these people that sort of very early on realized that we are technogenesis. We are sort of part of these machines, and they're part of us in, an, you know, a very egalitarian sense. Um, people like John Cage, I'll let him say it about sounds in his own way. Jim, Jim. And I yeah. hear what we call oh, sure. That's okay. I don't have no, sound. No, anyway. yes, yesterday, I don't know if anyone, if anyone saw it. I think it was on National Geographic. It was a program about, you know, about somebody, a blind man who climbed a mountain, and he had a camera on his, on his sunglasses, and the camera projected an image on this, this sort of thing that he put on his tongue. Mm. So he could actually, he could literally see with his tongue. Right, right. And he was like climbing up this huge mountain. There's, a, there's an excellent and long history of, uh, of sort of mouth-based acoustic treatments. There's actually a way of measuring your, your uh, lung cavity volume by sounding an echo into your body, <laughs> if you can imagine. Like, by measuring the reverb of your own lungs. But, and that's, it actually looks exactly like that, that apparatus. Anyway, uh, but what I was getting at there is that it's not only about tools, but about the way that medias might might be, uh, or medias or sounds in this case, might be ways of um, thinking about the autonomy of things besides us. When I hear what we call music, it seems to me that someone is talking, and talking about his feelings or about his ideas of relationships. But when I hear uh, traffic, the sound of traffic here on 6th Avenue, for instance, I don't have the feeling that anyone is talking. I have the feeling that uh, sound is acting. And I love the activity of sound. What it does is it gets uh, louder and quieter, and it gets higher and lower, and it gets longer and shorter. It does all those things which I've, I'm completely satisfied with that. I don't need sound to talk to me. <laughs> this is a lovely way of saying what I'm trying to say. Um, so, uh, and then of course with conceptual art, as we already heard John, Joseph Boys and people uh, like Alan Capra uh, positing that you know objects, entities, and beings have their own creativity that can never be caught inside a larger, more complete one, in this case, the art world, right? Why is it that we have to sort of necessitate that existence, that context, um, to encapsulate these things which are which could could exist in other realms. So is this the right model? Probably not. I guess I'm suggesting something that looks a little bit more like an ecology. An ecology that is, is, a, is a term that's been sort of bandied about and uh, you know is quite popular. And I think in a way it does stem out of system structures that you know the the, uh, the 70s um, and 60s art culture that I was trying to discuss there um, is uh, it's, it's the beginning of those, it's, it's the end of those same ideas. So systems and ecologies are really the same thing. It's just kind of devolving hierarchies and trying to make interrelationships more important than than piling things on top of each other. This was, by the way, the subject of a paper I just gave at Isaiah in Istanbul uh, called Creative Ecologies in Action, if you want to learn more about sort of uh, any of that. Um, so what does this look like uh, is a totally reasonable question. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think... Uh, I'll, I'll just suggest a couple of things. These are all, uh, no, they're not all pieces I've done. There's a few pieces that I've done. Um, and I say pieces because I'm really trying to re retain this ontology of the work that allows this to be something, right? Um, and that's why that paper has got that title, you know, the, the workshop as artwork. How do we build a social structure, a technological structure, and a kind of artistic structure that looks like a piece, that feels like a piece, that is a piece, um, that allows you to have the kind of creative capital that comes out of that sort of structure, but then at the same time acknowledges this kind of, this, these interrelationships. So 
Resonator uh, is, was a, a week-long mini-residency, which is the only way that I can try to encapsulate what it was, where we invited a, a number of sound artists, musicians, um, and then uh, other people who were trying to understand the world through sound. So people like ultrasound technicians, people like new age um, sound healers, and just see what happened, right? It was like insects in a jar kind of moment, um, where we got a, you know, a venue for a week, and, and we, we had uh, discussions in the morning, work sessions in the afternoon, all of which is very important because, uh, you know, in acknowledging the material realities of our relationships, sorry, the material and subjective realities of our relationships with creative technologies, let's say, we often end up in situations like this, where we're just talking, Right, and so how do we make events or even symposiums like this where we are kind of talking and working at the same time, and you feel like there's a hand to? And I think Joel's right. There's a biological component to this stuff that your body in action speaks differently than your body when it's not moving, or, um, you know, or, or making something. Um, so this guy is Stuart Reed, who is a sound healer who builds a machine called the Cymoscope, which if you sit in it, it aligns your your um, your sort of personal chakra vibrations with the universes. Um, I'm not sure that's true, uh, but <laughs> Hong Kyo Ryu, who is a you know a sound artist from uh, Seoul, who joined us that week, uh, and then a number, number of other people, and so the whole metastable structure of that was really kind of the interest. How do we talk about this when we want to suggest another one to another festival, right? So, building a form. Um, Chip Tune Marching Band is much sort of much more fun example of a similar thing, making. Um, creating a small community of the band members uh, of this kind of uh, DIY circuit building noise circuit uh, community, going out on the street doing performances, um, and then having people sort of being able to bring these things home and, and sort of love their little new instruments and potentially sort of relate to that community again. Um, and then a very recent thing, or at least uh, most recent of these three, which was uh, called MLB, which was sponsored by and helped out by Stime, where we took, um, I'm very interested in the idea of sort of uh, white light and strobos stroboscopic aesthetics. Um, and the way that they might be, a, a, and I'll talk about this later, uh, the way that they might be a, a way of sort of looking at our own perceptual mechanisms and you know, experiencing experience, as they say. Um, but what we did is we brought a bunch of people together who were interested in that kind of thing, those sorts of projects, and uh, had them spend a week together much like the, the sort of resonator structure. So instead of just bringing everyone together for a concert, instead of just bringing everyone together to talk about stuff, what happens if we just occupy you know, the Stime Studios for five days and talk about each other's work as we're kind of you know, making sound for each other? There was five artists in that initial one, and then we're hoping to take it transmediale this year with uh, seven artists. This uh, slide, or whatever you call it with this system, um, is just to note that I'm not the only person who's thinking this way. There's a lot of people doing work like this. Tetsuo Kugawa and his micro radio things, I think, are a lot like this. this is, Tetsuo Kugawa was interested in the, in the way in which a broadcast media could be inverted so that you make very small transmissions that then bring people to the transmitter and create a social situation, right? Um, and he did this in, in various formats, but workshops is one of them. John Richards and his dirty, dirty electronics work. Martin House, who does on the street uh, RF. Um, uh, what do you want to call it, accumulation or, or readings to just show people the sort of datascapes that are surrounding them. This is a very sort of uh, workshop-like format, but it's, it's also very performative and, and, and kind of like a... Um, you know, a situationist sort of move. And then uh, very recently, uh, I've come in contact with the UC Perica and Garnet Hertz, who uh, are doing this work now called Zombie Media Workshops, which is, um, somebody earlier mentioned media archaeology as a kind of methodology within a lot of the, the media studies discourse anyway, and circuit bending in a really interesting way, i.e. sort of finding an old circuit board and then starting to probe it in various ways. 
um, both evokes, you know, it might evoke a sort of uh, an AV output, but it also tells you a lot about the way that thing was built and the engineering context and the materials that it was made out of and what year it was made of, depending on how much lead's in it and all these, these sort of, these layers that balloon out from uh, these sorts of practices. And then hack labs and things like that are also kind of part of this movement, I'd say. So just to switch gears a little bit, that's the way that I conceive of a lot of the context um, of Sorry, the context of creating context for other people and other artists. Um, for my own practice, I will start uh, with a story about toilets. So the Super Bowl, 1987, there was um, a guy named Harvey Schultz who decided that he was going to warn the city that if everyone flushed at halftime, there was going to be a huge problem with the sewage system, right? Um, and so this is Harvey. It's total bullshit. <laughs> There's no way this could happen. But the interesting thing was, it was the first time that you know the Giants were in the Super Bowl. He was looking for a little bit of you know I don't know a little bit of space on the, in the newspaper, I guess, um, and a little bit of attention. Now, what's interesting about this is not necessarily that it's wrong uh, or, or or was a lie, um, because I don't think and the normal citizens didn't really. There's not much they could have done anyway, right? They're going to have to pee when they have to pee. But what was interesting about it was that that sort of story told the city about its own water system in a way that they started to learn about it, right? So all of a sudden they were aware that there's this, oh, there's a water system. <laughs> oh, it's interconnected with all my neighbors. Oh, there's this sort of, you know, this resonance outward. Um, and I'm really interested in making artworks like Harvey's, right? <laughs> um, because what I, what I think is interesting about that is it creates an opportunity for the real epistemes or the real learning opportunities in complex systems. Um, like, you know, this is the, just to, to highlight that, of course, you don't, you don't have to tell a, a made-up story. You could tell a real one about the blackout, right, uh, in 2003 um, or, you know, the nuclear crises in Japan. Well, last time I was at Stein, I talked about this in terms of energy music, which is, was a set of practical investigations um, which are kind of ongoing about ways in which we might actually create, you know, electronic music with kinetic um, motion or uh, solar solar energies because not necessarily because it's the best way to create electronic music but because it, in doing so you sort of highlight what it is that's kind of behind all this stuff all the time anyway you know in a certain way you can think about all music making as this process just doing this <laughs> right what? sorry okay um, and so this has become a general way of thinking about media for me. This is just a picture that highlights this really well. That you know, there's always something inside the representation that is matter or energy, and that's something that we often forget, especially when we get into this rhetoric about um, weightlessness and, and, and sort of virtuality, which I'm not for. Um, so this is an art form that might be epistemic. Uh, Alvin Noe says it this way: opportunities to understand the environment we live in by exploring bits of it in order to attain a perspicuous overview, where at first there is none. Maybe more simply, art is my way of understanding the world. Um, a nice sort of reference for this, uh, again, conceptual art um, from that sort of 60s, 70s era, Hans Hacke, who he's often uh, criticized for having moved from a, a mode of working that was very object-based and sort of easy to understand in a physical sense into this political realm, which is probably thought of as his less good work, I guess. Um, but what's interesting is the way that these things are the same, right? If you look at the condensation cube piece, which is just a you know, kind of contained vat full of water that continuously refluxes, um, it's a little bit like a political system if you start to analyze it in a systems or ecological way. It's just a series of relationships that sort of create a whole. Um, so that's, that's just a, an inspiration of sorts. In the musical or, or, or acoustic world, we might look at something like uh, Murray Schaefer's you know, acoustic ecology movement, which again was very material. He was very interested in the way that you might compose the soundscape around you, but then created an awareness and a kind of movement around itself that, that is, is both political, social, um, uh, and material. Um, I will say that tomorrow there's going to be an amazing session <laughs> by this woman named Penelope Gook uh, and a few other folks that are joining um, that, that talks about this from the other way. So all this was this is really about an art practice that might allow us an epistemic structure, whereas, of course, there's an episteme or a, a learning that comes out of any kind of media that we might already have, like any kind of artwork. Um, Penelope wrote this book that, that, amongst other things, talks about the ways in which music may have been the format from which we get things like mathematics if you can imagine. Um, and this image sort of summarizes that, but in the interest of time, I won't go into it. This is the hand of God tuning the earth, right? Um, and then other people in the media archaeology world. 
So a couple pieces of my own that sort of look at this sort of thing. Uh, natural resources was a set of small performances, uh, interventions, whatever you want to call them, um, in New York, where we went around looking at, there's a number of public outlets in New York City that are used for things like cleaning the, the marble outside of the Chase Manhattan um, bank building or for trimming the, uh, the bushes in Central Park. There's actually one electrical outlet that's been now covered by a, the root of a tree in Central Park, which I recommend you go see. Um, but these things are, you know, and they've been discovered by homeless people for surviving the winters. By They'll set up little tents and, and put heaters in front of them. But generally, they go unnoticed, and uh, nobody's really sure who's paying for the energy. So in a weird way, they're like a natural resource for the city. And just by uh, doing a few little investigations, we were hoping to sort of highlight that. After we discovered the infrastructure, what else could you do with it, right? So RoboPoems, which I presented in 2009 at the Conflux Festival, which does have a sort of audio component, um, which is poetry that was in Manhattan. It's a set of transmitters that essentially take advantage of this entire energy infrastructure, right? So you could walk around the city tuning into a certain frequency and then hear that I must transmit and you must receive. Someone must receive. Otherwise, I will have been trapped inside this shell in which I cannot even clench my teeth. All this time for nothing, unless you receive. Unless you listen. Bit sad, actually. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so just highlighting this infrastructure once again. Uh, circuit music, I, uh, there's a lot of ways to talk about this piece, and this is part of what I did within that MLB sort of group structure that Stein supported last year. Um, most recently, it's become a, a kind of megaphone type uh, piece of equipment, which is really used, um, this is at the Silent Barn in New York, is really used to try to walk around a space and explore it um, as a performer, right? So to not just... It's, it's a fourth wall issue for, in, in some regard, but it's also just a way of thinking about uh, acoustics and, and sort of stroboscopic light as a, as, a, as a way of noticing the environment. Uh, one of the things that I, I have a, a quote here from somebody who went to one of the MLB shows in Vienna. Um, I had no choice but to look at the room around me, at the other people in the space, because there's such a kind of a front that noise music, and uh, especially with strobes. Um, sort of uh, gives the people that it often becomes quite uh, a moment of reflection on other things than, than the performance itself. Um, and my interest in all this is to catch ourselves in the act of perceiving, um, you know, and, uh, and sort of realize that, our again, our actions with materials are not uh, ones of control, but a sort of, a sort of ecology of different relationships. Um, I'll skip the video because I think I'm probably running out of time. Can you, can you talk to I'll come to an end soon. Yes, good, okay. So uh, another one, another piece that's, that's sort of in this vein, acoustic subtraction, really just playing white noise into large acoustic spaces. Uh, the most recent one we did was in Istanbul, um, kind of uh, appended to the Isaiah proceedings, where uh, we were really lucky to have met a very, very understanding and very astute sort of contemporary art-interested imam um, who ran a uh, the Eyup Mosque, which is a historic mosque in, in the middle of Istanbul. Um, he he let us set up a, a, a four channels of uh, speakers and blast white noise into the space while people were still praying. Um, the idea behind this, of course, that you know, it's a, it's very cheap and and sort of. Uh, probably a bit more activating form of, uh, of uh, noise suppression, right? So you don't hear anything except for the white noise. When it turns off, all the sounds that are in the space sort of run back into your head. Um, and it's, it's, again, it's conceived of as a kind of ecology of acoustic architectures. Um, and then the last piece, which uh, yeah, I'll talk about briefly, is not anything to do with sound. Um, I've, I've recently been commissioned by the uh, Olympic Cultural Committee and, and the BBC to look at the... They have a series of big screens that they've just put up because of the Olympics in the UK, which is a huge infrastructure, and it's quite Orwellian in a certain sense um, because it's, they're conceived of as giant televisions that just get plopped down in the city centers of you know, uh, all these communities um, so that they can watch the Olympics, right? in 2012. Um, what I thought would be interesting was, would be to look at the kind of output of these as um, almost like a resonant structure or, or some, some form of projection to the space, I guess. So this is a, a, you know, a Google image of one of the spaces and the, and the, the throw that these screens have. Um, and so what we're going to do over the next couple of months is develop ways of sort of looking at and, 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 and documenting how the spaces in front of these screens have been have been changed, and I have this kind of conceit that I want to try to hire a satellite and take a picture of UK in one color. <laughs> um, 
So that's it. Uh, I guess what I was trying to describe here today was uh, situating ecological, epistemic, sound, and art towards living in a world we seek, seek to understand. So thanks very much. <laughs> there is a question. Can you yep, <coughs> wait for the microphone? Thank you all. It's been very interesting to listen to. Um, the whole point about conceptual art versus music is something that I've been interested in for a long time because, I mean, the, the various speakers have mapped that territory out quite well, I think, so I don't want to reflect on that too much. But uh, to me, music always seems to be something visceral and something that exists in the moment and something that's performed and not something that's thought about or conceptualised and things like attributing structure to music is kind of a musicological or compositional abstraction from what music actually is to me. Um, and I, thought, I, I was just wondering if you guys could reflect and discuss that within the context of, of the things you've been talking about. Are you talking about music or sound? Hmm. Well, I, I equate them. Yeah, me too. <laughs> okay. I, I guess structures, you know, it, it sounds like a, a sort of a criticism in the sense that like we're always trying to impose structure, right? That, that's always the the maneuver that. In, but I think that what, what if I do, were to offer sort of an ecological model for the way that you know, I think about artworks or whatever, or my relationship to technologies when I make artworks, it's only because I'm trying to understand something, right? It's not because I think that that needs to be. It, it's not a truth, in that sense. It's just it's just a way of opening up. You know, dialogues and, and nomenclature and, and sort of relationships for me. So, in, in that sense, you're absolutely right. None of that is true, and I don't think it's true of music any more than it is of art. It's just a way of describing things, like languages. Is that sort of what you meant? Because I, I'm not trying to impose structure that's not there. I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, but, but even even if, and, if, if sir, Taco, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I do think, of course, you can look at music as something which is uh, intrinsically. Uh, play, uh, something that happens between people. Um, but there is an equally valid way of enjoying music, and I think I, 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 do, I do that, uh, I enjoy it like that, I think, which, which is about structure. When I listen to music, I listen to constructs, I, uh, in a way as I look at, uh, at architecture, uh, which has uh, in that sense, which is dehumanized in the sense that it, 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 it's not, of course it's about who made it, who makes it, or whatever, what's happening, but it's about how this thing is is existing, which is, of course, a bit of the ideal of the, uh, I think, the early electronic composers working in, uh, in virtual sound space, in a way. I think that's equally valid, and it, it's just two ways of looking at it. You can also look at a painting well, at something some, someone did somewhere and see the action of the, of the brush in, in retrospect, or see a construct. Yeah, well, and even if you, if, you, if you do take it very seriously, the whole, the whole physical aspect of you know, as, as making a sound that sometimes even resonates within your own body, even then, you know, where you, where and why you do this makes a big difference as to what the sounds are that you make. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I, I, make, I make completely different sounds when I'm on my own versus when I'm with people versus when we're all together playing for even more people. And so, so you know, a lot of these things that these guys have been talking about are all about how is all that stuff framed? You know, how does, how, where, because the framing actually does determine or in the end does determine the meaning of it all, you know, even of the sound you make. So whatever it is you make gets different meanings depending on why it was done or where it was done or by whom. It, they don't negate each other, I think. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. Um, but even the notion that, that there is a, a sort of meaning in this elevate well, shifts the di discourse towards concept. Mm. Um, I mean, the experience doesn't necessarily have intrinsic meaning in a musical sense. Well, that's the point. It has, you know, the, the, the intrinsicness of, you know, what it does. I'm, I'm avoiding the word meaning here. Uh, or, you know, the, Gregory Bateson calls meaning the difference that makes makes a difference. 
I, you know, it's, it's, the data is something you can hear, and information, or you know, which is what art is all about. And is the difference that makes a difference? That makes you, hey, you know, you note it. It, it changes something in who you are, or how you think, or how you feel. In that sense, but that's always dependent on its context. And it, it's, it's kind of interesting if you look at linguistics that linguists have really tried to, you know, for instance, in, in it feels like artificial intelligence, linguists have tried to sort of explain away the world when talking about something like semantics. But turns out, you, even in language, you can't really talk about semantics without taking its pragmatics into account. Like, where is something said? People have these amazing, you know, meaningful conversations that don't contain a single correct sentence, for instance. But it's, it's all, it's all, you know. What's that's that phrase that, that um, writing about music is like dancing about architecture? Oh yeah. And I always think, what's wrong with dancing about architecture? Right. <laughs> that's great. You know, <laughs> that's what you're into. <laughs> Anybody else? Wait for the microphone, Joel. Well, it seems like some of the opposition here between patterns and pleasure, because it is a kind of oppositional statement, is the presumption we make that structuring and patterning, patterning is a kind of arcane, uh, specialized, abstract you know, sort of thing, rather than what I know it is as a musician. It's something intuitive. I know how to do this. You know? And you do too. And that's the reason everybody likes music. You can be a pygmy, a mom, a uh, grandmother, you know, anybody Does can get involved in music. music. Do and they don't. I know some pretty, pretty groovy grandmothers, actually. <laughs> but um, I, 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 there is a context. I'm not talking about the context issue. I'm saying that there's an expertise and that the pattern things is it's not owned by mathematicians in Adorno, mm, actually. No. Exactly. exactly. Okay. Yeah. yeah, nor is structure, right? Yeah. But they just sound like sort of architectural words somehow. Well, nor is intuition owned by the visceral. Exactly, yeah. yeah. You, know, you can have a cognitive intuition, even a spiritual intuition about things, yeah. No, it's conceptuality. I mean, that's the whole point, to see... Well, con- <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it's also... It's what I said about concept art, which is not at all about rationalizing the whole uh, artistic yeah, process. Yeah. It's about actually aestheticizing or uh, uh, researching the aesthetics of of things like con- uh, uh, brands concepts and, and brands mm-hmm. and things like that. So it's actually claiming back all these kind of rationalized spaces for uh, for uh, for art or for experience. It is taking seriously that Caprao moment of integration of art and life. It, like it, it is tying your shoes in a different way every day, and those sort of little moments of creativity that you know that I think is the promise of a, of, of what those people were talking about for me anyway. That's, mm-hmm. that's my touch point for that stuff. I, I don't use words like brand, but. I, I understand what you mean. It's expanding an artistic sphere and allowing things to, ha- yeah. to happen in an aesthetic sense. Yeah. I just have a quick question. Um, I mean, it's hard for me also being so inside of just kind of agreeing with you guys on most things to actually know where the opposition oh. is. It seems to me that it's clear that context wow. matters. So maybe you guys could tell me about more where context doesn't matter. Mm. Because when you say context is everything, or it, it's all about the context, then what are we talking about? Mm. It's maybe saying that there is only context. Well, that, that seems apparent to me. So why do we even have this session? So can well, you give me a... in, 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 I think that to, to me it's important that... <laughs> I, I am one of the organizers, by the way. So, um, <laughs> so, so maybe, maybe you could give us... Maybe we agree here, but I, I think in, uh, um, if I look at the art being made in the, in the broadest sense of so music, visual arts, literature, all, the, all this media art uh, especially also, there's a lot of confusion, especially in media art, I see a lot of a lot of work that actually mixes up this whole idea that that art is uh, some kind of social, rationalized uh, uh, experiment, experiment instead of uh, uh, something that has to do with the senses and with the um, uh, with the exper- uh, experience side of, of, of life, the things that you don't uh, uh, exactly uh, understand in that way. 
So uh, it's good that we tend to agree here, but I think that, 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 that reality shows that there's a lot of work to be done. And it's, if, we, um, if we don't do anything, it's going in the wrong direction, because everything is going to be rationalized. Yeah, I just I, I would say you're probably hanging out with the right people, <laughs> because in a certain like I, I I can name five contexts where this is a real problem. Um, I'll name two just for for, for time. But um, like the UK studio arts tradition, for example, in which I ostensibly dabble and teach occasionally, is very much a production engine for for objects. Right, and so there, there is this sense in which you close the doors for two years and do your MFA, open the doors again, and you have a piece, and that to me is, is I think, in opposition to everything that's been said today. Um, the, the other one is, is I, I tried to address it in terms of a couple of the products that I've actually done, which is that how do you explain something like a procedural, or processual, or con context-driven piece to something like a commissioning engine or somebody who runs a festival, or yes. you know, these things are very practical in a certain sense. Like I want to get together with people and have a sort of intersubjective time. <laughs> You know, what does that mean? And so, that, you know, that, I agree, but that, that's one of the things I, I, I want to say about your uh, question is, is that uh, uh, what I see is that, that com for example, com composers make, the, make a composition and then, uh, uh, or, or uh, uh, string cortex make, make a program and, 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 and do not uh, make a context or do not think in the context of a festival, of the context of the program of, of, of a venue, and then and, and they don't do realize, or they are then surprised that they don't invite it to come. But, and, and that's a really problem. But it, 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 when you make a program for a, uh, for a string quartet, you make a program at your own and, and don't make a contact and don't think about where do I play that and who can I, can I find it. Nobody wants that. Nobody. That, and, and you have to think as a, as a composer, as a musician, as an artist in context of the, of the society, of the context of the venues, the context of where can I play, when can I play my work. If you don't do that, then you have a really problem. You're right that it's always there, though. I mean, that's yeah, not new. But do you, th do you think it's mainly sort of an institutional structure that's still sort of hanging on and sort of imposing? Or do you think it's still also as a practice in today that uh, so much of the majority of art or you know, artists are still working in a very contextless uh, way yeah. of working? I could address that in one sense. In one, in one sense, it's a lot easier not to, right? Because you don't have that much responsibility. I just make the piece, you know? And so these things like like our relationships to energies and infrastructures and stuff like that, I'm very interested in. Um, I'm not trying to guilt anyone. <laughs> but there's the sense in which that kind of dialogue is 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 what people think is outside of their purview, you know? And, and I think that can be kind of dangerous. You're responsible for everything as an artist because no one's asking you to do what you're doing. Can can you can you wait for the microphone? Mike, wait for the mic. We want to record it, so so it's good when you speak in the mic. Uh, now, is it? Uh, I I I, uh, yeah, I was thinking not long ago. To uh, I'm not in many uh, social uh, media networks, but <laughs> one I, I was in. We were thinking about maybe to create a, a curator's death list. <laughs> Uh, because the concern of many artists... The curator's death list? Death list, yeah, that you can find <laughs> your... Hi, you are, In people you want to kill? You are second <laughs> on this list. Now, just uh, like the, the, there are many curators. And, yes, uh, uh, yeah, I, I sometimes... If I'm wrong, please interrupt me, but I have often the feeling that um, many people are shopping art. Uh, curators are shopping for art. They take the pieces, they look around around the world, and they take the pieces and put them in a gallery, mm. put them in a festival. And there is very little space for artists to develop wor uh, work for a specific context. So, and th uh, that is a big problem, I think, at the moment. This is this is not this is not a, a great uh, tendency for for this. What we are propagating at the moment. But uh, you, uh, I agree. Uh, I agree with that. But the, uh, I think you have to, uh, uh, as an artist, to 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 make your own 
places to, to show. Don't rate at curators, don't rate at pro programmers, because the, there are a few festivals. There are f f so I think the most important thing for, for artists nowadays is that you create your own venues. That's one, but uh, keep communicating, please. You know, it is interesting to think about why that might be. And I, I would return to responsibility. I'd also return about to just like hard-working people. It's very difficult to do the kinds of things you were describing. For example, you need permissions and it's more work. Yeah, it's it is a lot more, work. more work. In a way, it was what, like like you just said. You know, it's it's so nice to be only you know focused mm. on this little thing. And the, you know, part of the point I guess everybody's here is, is trying to make is there's more than just this one thing. You know, if you if you don't open your mind to this, you know, to, to creation of your own context. You know, you're going to get stuck in somebody else's context. For instance, you know the gallery commercial system of how art dealers and art buyers work. You know that's you know what a great yeah, context. but that is already that far that festivals who are uh, yeah uh, uh, propagating their their to develop work. Many work actually is bought uh, like they act like gallery gallerists. Well, you know, even yeah. But if somebody, somebody telling somebody else that something is cool, yeah, you know, in course, a sense, yeah, is yeah. the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, if, yeah. However, if if you want to experiment with stuff like this, come to Stein. You know, we'll <laughs> love to work with you. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we're going to have to sort of uh, end the session. It's 10 to 6. We're 50 minutes behind, I think. Is that okay? 20 minutes. Oh, 20 minutes. So that's okay. Good. Oh. <laughs> Unless anyone has a really, you know, a burning question that they want to ask. <coughs> okay, I'd like to leave it at this uh, for today. Thank you guys uh, for your lovely time. I guess this this, converse, this conversation will more or less continue tomorrow morning when Joel is actually leading uh, a session on intuition. And it's going to be very interesting, you know, to see how... These issues of intuition and viscerality and the body, how, are the, how they are going to play out. There's a bit of a kinship between that. And tomorrow afternoon, there's a session on the complexity. Uh, where we'll be discussing, be discussing things like that. And I'll be hosting that. So see you this evening. Uh, have fun this evening, and see you tomorrow. Thanks, guys.